Thank you for joining us for this episode of The Pilgrim's Pulpit, a ministry of Josh Pilgrim, pastor of Riverview Baptist Church in Calhoun, Georgia. Our aim is to produce faithful, maturing disciples of Jesus through passionate, Christ-centered, expositional preaching. As Colossians chapter 1, verse 28 says, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. John chapter 10, if you remain standing as we read from God's word, say that he says, I am the door. John chapter 10, I'm gonna read verses one through 10. John chapter 10, beginning in verse one. You can also find this on page 842 of the Pew Bibles in front of you. John 10, beginning in verse one. Riverview, this is God's word. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. The big idea today is very simple, and I think most of us may understand it from the words of Jesus when he claims to be the door. The big idea is that Jesus is the only way by which we can become part of the people of God. There is no other way to heaven. There is no other way to know God apart from knowing Jesus. That's what we celebrate during this Advent season is that God made himself known in the person of Jesus Christ. And God not only made himself known, but he made a way to him through Christ. John Calvin said, no plague is more destructive to the church than when wolves ravage under the garb of shepherds. Shepherds are called to lead people to Christ and to lead them to the Lord, but false shepherds are a great danger to the sheep. One of the ways that God cared for Israel was by appointing human shepherds, leaders who were supposed to care for God's flock. But the Pharisees who were supposed to lead Israel were not caring for the sheep. They were hurting the sheep. Instead of leading the people to obey God, they were leading the people away from God into empty religion. Instead of bringing the people to graze in the pastures of God's grace, they were instead loading them up with the weight of religion and making them plow barren fields of legalism. Instead of 
guarding the flock. They were guiding them to turn away from God and trust in their own efforts. Instead of leading them to overflowing blessings of grace, they were leaving the sheep distressed, diseased, and spiritually dead. And Bill read from Ezekiel 34, which is the backdrop for this story in John chapter 10. In Ezekiel 34, God condemned the religious leaders of Israel for their mistreatment of God's sheep. He says that the shepherds have left his sheep exposed. They've forced the sheep to fend for themselves. They've even killed some of the sheep for their wool and their meat. And in response, the end of Ezekiel 34 is a great promise that God would set up one shepherd over the flock, his servant, David. Now, as you read that earlier, you may have thought, oh, King David is gonna lead the people. There's only one problem. When Ezekiel wrote those words, David had already been dead for hundreds of years. So it can't be David. No, no, David had been long dead. This was the promise of a king who would come from the line of David. It's a promise about the Messiah. And all of that background helps us to interpret Jesus' words in John chapter 10. Jesus fulfills Ezekiel 34. The shepherds of Israel neglected the sheep. They were reckless and destructive. But God never forgot about his flock. He sent a shepherd to rescue and care for his sheep. So when you read Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, Jesus looks out at the people of Israel, and it says when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Well, who was harassing them? It was the spiritual leaders. It was the Pharisees the people who should have been guiding them. And so in John chapter 10, Jesus makes two amazing I am statements. He's already made two I am statements in the gospel of John. You'll remember in John chapter six, he said, I am the bread of life. And in John chapter eight, verse 12, he said, I am the light of the world. But now Jesus is going to make two more I am statements. In verse 10, he's going to tell them, I am the door by which the sheep enter into the sheepfold. And in verse 11, he's going to tell them, I am the good shepherd. This picture of the shepherd and the door is, is the, the two images that come out in this chapter that we want to look at. What does Jesus do as the good shepherd? And what does he do as the door for the sheep? I want to point out three of those today. Uh, that are in this whole passage. We're not gonna look at the third one as much, but I wanna mention it here. It's leading to what Jesus is gonna do for his sheep. But beginning in verse one through verse six, the first act of ministry that the shepherd does for his people is that Jesus gathers his sheep. Jesus is gathering a people for himself. Look at what he says in verse one. He begins with the words, truly, truly, I say to you. Now he's following up on something he just said. Before we go any further, we need to remember what just happened to force Jesus to give this figure of speech, this parable that he's about to give. Why does Jesus suddenly claim to be a door? And why does he talk about his role as a shepherd? What brought that about? Well, by saying truly, truly, Jesus is referencing back to something that just happened. Now, if you were here last week, you'll remember in the previous chapter, Jesus had miraculously healed a blind man. And when the man goes back to the temple to show himself to the Pharisees, they denied the miracle. They denied that he had even been born blind. They denied everything because Jesus had healed this man on the Sabbath. They have to bring in the man's parents to confirm that he was actually born blind. And over and over again, the blind man tells of how Jesus healed him, and yet the Pharisees remain skeptical. 
The point of chapter nine is summed up in verse 39, where Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who think they can see will become blind. We remember the point, of course, is that the Pharisees who are actually blind, it's the Pharisees who are blind to Jesus, even though they are considered to be the teachers and spiritual leaders or shepherds of God's people, while the man born blind is the one who truly sees the glory of of Jesus. But the worst part of the story is that after the blind man claims that Jesus must be sent from God since he was able to heal him, the Pharisees say, you were born in utter sin. And would you teach us? And it says that they cast him out. Out. Remember, they kick him out of the synagogue. They kick him out of their community. He was escorted off the temple property, never to be allowed in again. And so get this picture. Instead of being a place where people are welcomed to come and meet God, the temple had become a place where the shepherds are slamming the door to keep people out. Is it possible that the church could get in people's way of meeting Jesus? I had a pastor tell me recently that his church criticized him for ministering with an ethnic minority group in their community. They complained, hey, these people don't look like us. God forbid that ever happen here. I mean, how can the world meet Jesus in the church if, if people who claim to be Christians are keeping the door shut to keep the world out? Now, apparently, this wasn't the first time that the priest had kicked somebody out of church because they seemed to have this reputation. In Matthew 23, it's the woe chapter. It's full of Jesus just criticizing and rebuking the Pharisees, telling them, woe to you. Listen to some of these. In Matthew 23, verse 1, Jesus said, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so practice and obey what they tell you, but not what they do, for they preach, but they do not practice. Or verse 4, Jesus said, The Pharisees tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and they lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. Or verse 5, Jesus said, They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts, and they love the best seats in the synagogues. But listen to this one, verse 13 of Matthew 23. Jesus said, But woe to you, scribes, and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Notice Jesus says these people think they're going to heaven, but they are not. And they are trying to keep other people out. And so Jesus is speaking in John 10 to a group of people who have literally tried to shut the door of heaven in people's faces and said, you are not welcome here. You are not good enough to come in and be with us. But just before the door slams all the way shut, just before you hear the click, Jesus sticks his foot in the temple door and says, wait just a minute. This is not your door to shut. Who may made you the gatekeepers to God. Truly, truly, I tell you, I am the door. I'm the one who gets to say who comes in and who stays out. I'm the one who knows my sheep. I am the only way to get to God. It is not by you, not by your teachings. Don't listen to these people. And Jesus says, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. Now that brings us to verse one. Jesus says there's one way to get in, but there's wrong ways to get in too. And the first thing that Jesus tells us here in verse one is that false shepherds refuse to use the door. 
They don't use the door that God set up. They don't want to go in God's way. Remember, the Pharisees were proud that they were going to go to heaven by their works. They thought by keeping the law that they could be right with God. Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees for being wicked shepherds. Wolves clothed with sheep wool. He says, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. Now, you got to understand a little bit about shepherding, and I'm not an expert on this, but the sheepfold was usually a courtyard that was beside a house, and it was bordered by a stone wall in which several families would keep their sheep. And those sheepfolds, they may not have a a door formally, but they would be guarded by a gatekeeper. And the only way, the only right way in for the sheep was to go through that gate, to go through the door. And Jesus says there is only one right way into the sheepfold. What is the sheepfold? Jesus is talking about his kingdom, his people, his flock. There's only one way to be a part of God's people, and it is to go through the door. But there is another way that is taken by thieves and robbers who try to subvert the shepherd by stealing the sheep. And the reason why the thief and robber refuse to go in by the door is because they only have an interest in stealing and hurting the sheep. And so if you're taking notes, we need to ask this question. What's What's a thief? What's a robber? Is there a difference between a thief and a robber? Now, Linguistically, not really, not much of a difference, but I do think there's a subtle difference. A thief is deceptive. A thief is deceptive. A a thief is sneaky. A thief doesn't want to get caught. A thief is deceptive, but a robber is destructive. A robber is destructive. Say, a robber is forceful. Robbers, they'll they'll rob you at gunpoint. They don't care who they hurt or what they tear up or what they break along the way. A thief tries to get in and out. Now, Jesus says that the one who comes in on another way is a thief and a robber, which means the Pharisees were both. They're both. They're sneaky, they're deceptive, and they're destructive. They are forceful. And the reason we know he's talking about the Pharisees, is because there is no break between John 9, 41 and John 10, verse 1. No break in time. This is a continuation of this conversation. And it's an unmistakable connection. The Pharisees are the thieves and the robbers. They got to their position of shepherd-like leadership without the blessing of the gatekeeper you look at verse 3, it says it's to the shepherd, the true shepherd, that the gatekeeper opens. But they're not interested in being approved by a gatekeeper. They are not faithful shepherds. They are the stranger in verse 5. If you look at verse 5, Jesus says, a stranger the sheep will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. The sheep that belong to the true shepherd will not be controlled by these Pharisees. So false shepherds refuse to use the door. But now Jesus talks about true shepherds. And he says the true shepherd leads his sheep through the door. If you look at verse 2, Jesus compares the thief and the robber. And in verse 2 he says, But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now, we learn several characteristics about the true shepherd. Now, I think there are, there are really two applications of who is the shepherd. Primarily, the shepherd is Jesus. Jesus says that down in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. But I think this also can apply to those other good spiritual leaders. A good spiritual leader, a good pastor, a good Sunday school teacher a good godly parent is going to lead their people to the door. And who is the door? It's Jesus. A good pastor is not gonna try to sneak in and and take over and, and abuse the sheep. He's gonna seek to lead the sheep to the door, to Christ. Now, let's point out some of these characteristics of the true shepherd. 
And I think this is really describing Jesus. The first characteristic of the true shepherd is that he knows each sheep intimately. He knows each sheep intimately. If you look at verse three, it says, to him, the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name. Jesus knows each sheep intimately. In John 10, 27, later in this chapter, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. He says, I know them. I know my sheep. Can I encourage you this morning, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus, then you are his sheep, and you will never be forgotten. Now, religious leaders may cast you aside, but your shepherd will come and gather you to himself. I want you to be comforted today in knowing this, that Jesus Christ knows everything about you. He knows you better than your spouse. He knows you better than your children. He knows you better than your parents. He knows every detail about you. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows your strengths and your weaknesses. He knows if you're an older sheep who walks a little slower now. He knows if you're a younger sheep full of energy and enthusiasm who likes to wander away and explore and needs a little more correction. He knows when you need to rest. He knows when you need to eat. He knows everything about you. Better than, than I do as a pastor, Jesus, as your good shepherd, knows everything about you. He knows your greatest needs. Now, he not only knows his sheep Intimately, there's a second characteristic in this text. He calls each sheep individually. He knows each sheep intimately, and he calls each sheep individually. Look at verse three. It says, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name. Now, the sheep hear his voice through the external call. How do we hear his voice today? We hear it through the gospel. When someone proclaims the gospel, Jesus is calling out to his sheep. But amidst that external general call that goes to everybody, every individual sheep will always hear the internal call of the Holy Spirit. That specific drawing effect of the Holy Spirit. If you are his sheep, then he will call you by name and you will hear his voice I love Isaiah 43, verse 1. It's a great verse to memorize. God says, But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. He calls his own sheep by name because the sheep are not alone. He has to call them out. He has to specify who he is speaking to. You see, in this sheep pen would have been other sheep. There would be some goats, possibly, amidst the sheep. Many would rather stay in that sheepfold of religion. And Jesus only brings out those who are his own. He calls his sheep, you'll notice in verse 3, to lead them out. Look at verse 3 again. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Out of what? Out of the world. Out of the world and into his sheepfold. Out of, out of ungodliness and wickedness and into fellowship with him. When you become a Christian, as one of his sheep, Jesus Christ is calling you to follow him and to forsake the world. The world behind me, the cross before me. I will follow him. Colossians 1.13 says he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. When you become a sheep, he's taking you out of the world and bringing you into the people of God. And he does that by calling each sheep individually. He knows us intimately. He calls each of us individually. There's a third characteristic of the good shepherd. He draws each sheep irresistibly. You say, where is, there is that idea. Well, it's in verse 4. 
And it's in one little word. When. Look at verse 4. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him. You notice verse 4 doesn't say, if he brings out all his own. He's not trying to bring out his sheep. Trying means he might fail. He will save all of his sheep. He says when they come out, not if, when. If you are a sheep of the Lord Jesus, when you hear his voice, eventually you will come. Now, you might be stubborn for a while, and you might show some resistance, but I promise if you belong to him, you will be overcome with his irresistible calling on your life. Jesus says this in other places. The point here, the shepherd calls his sheep, and they definitely will come. And Because notice this, before Jesus even calls them, they already belong to him. You notice that? They, they are his sheep before he calls them. God gave his sheep to the son. This is, we're putting all this theology together that we've learned. So if you go back to John chapter 6, verse 37, Jesus said, everyone the father gives me will come to me. Jesus approaches the sheep pen of the world and he preaches the truth. He calls out. He sends his missionaries. He sends Christians to preach the gospel. And he calls out his own sheep by name. And those who were given to him by the Father before the foundation of the world, they hear the voice of their shepherd and they come to him. You don't become his sheep because you follow him. You follow him because you already are his sheep. That's why Jesus tells the Pharisees later, he says, the reason you don't believe in me is because you are not of my sheep. And so friends, if you come to him, it is because long, long before you were ever born, the father gave you as one of his own to the son that one day you would come to the Son, you would hear the shepherd's voice, and you would follow him. Now this leads to the last characteristic of, of this shepherd. He not only knows each sheep intimately, and he calls them by name individually, he draws them irresistibly, and finally, he saves each sheep invincibly. He saves them. If you look all the way down at verse nine, look at what Jesus says. He says, I am the door... If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. If you look all the way down at verse 28, Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Friends, I want you to be encouraged this morning that you are eternally secure in the hands of your shepherd. You will not be lost if you belong to him. He will lose none that has been given to him. And all the credit goes to the shepherd. All the glory goes to the shepherd, not to the sheep. We need to remember this, that the glory in salvation does not belong to the sinner, but to the Savior. We, I think we forget this because most of us aren't farmers being called a sheep is not a compliment. Sheep aren't known for their intelligence. I've got a great little video, uh, maybe I'll post it later uh, online, of it's this guy saying, uh, he pulls a sheep out of a ditch, and he says, this is what you are when you think you can go your own way. The shepherd pulls this sheep out of a 10-foot ditch, finally gets him out, the sheep runs about five steps this way, makes a U-turn, and goes right back into the ditch. The reason that we need a shepherd is because sheep are dull and defenseless. I don't know of a single person who's afraid of a sheep. I mean, they're like, it's like a walking pillow. Right? No one's afraid of a pillow. They have no natural way to defend themselves. And that image should keep you from exalting yourself. On your best day, you will always be a helpless sheep desperately in need of a shepherd. Now, we've talked about how Jesus is gathering his sheep. What we see in these verses, in verses 1 to 6, 
False shepherds refuse to use the door. True shepherds lead the sheep through the door, and the good shepherd is the door. The the metaphor gets mixed here. Jesus is going to say, I'm not only the shepherd who leads my sheep, I'm also the door by which they must walk through. There's there's a great image in, this is a verse you can write down, in Micah chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. It combines the images of Christ as shepherd and leading them through a gate. So Micah 2, verse 12. He says, I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob, I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like sheep in a fold, like a flock in its pasture, a noisy multitude of men. And then it says, he who opens the breach goes up before them. They break through and pass the gate going out by it. The king passes on before them, the Lord at their head. Jesus is both shepherd and door. Now, what we see here about this good shepherd and false shepherds, this is in verse five, the sheep will always flee from false shepherds. Look at verse five. It says, a stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. These Pharisees, the people didn't listen to them. They, they, they didn't listen. They were afraid of them. Now, Jesus says the sheep flee from false shepherds, but he says the sheep will follow the good shepherd. If you look at verse 4, it says, When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Notice that Jesus does not drive his sheep from behind like a slave master. He simply walks in front of them, and they follow him. They follow because they know his voice. And so in verse 6, this section closes, you'll notice, with an explanation from John that while Jesus used this figure of speech with them, the people, the leaders, did not understand what he was saying to them. So this reminds us of two truths, and then I'll, I'll move on. Number one, Jesus came to give sight to some And yet he has a blinding effect on other people. And these people are being blinded, like Jesus just said. These leaders did not understand because they were unwilling to believe. And the second truth we get from verse 6 is the reason they did not understand Jesus is because they were not of his sheep. Jesus says this explicitly in verse 26. The reason you do not believe is because you are not of my sheep. These leaders do not understand Jesus' words because they can't hear his voice, which proves that they are not his sheep. So the first major point we've seen in verses 1 to 6 is that Jesus gathers his sheep. But in verses 7 through 10, as the door, Jesus also guards his sheep. If you look at verse 7, Jesus It says, so Jesus again said to them. That so means because they didn't get it the first time, Jesus is going to give them another chance. So, he says it again, verse 7, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. And so, as the door, Jesus is the only way we can become part of the people of God. He's not just the shepherd, he's also the gate by which you get in. Doesn't this remind us of John 14, 6? It's a good verse to memorize with your children. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. That's another way of saying, I'm the gate. I'm the way. I'm the way to God. I'm the truth. I'm the truth of the gospel. I am life. I am the way to have eternal life. But you notice Jesus makes some promises as the door Look at verse 8. Jesus said, All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. Jesus is referring to all of these pretenders, these messianic pretenders, people who tried to draw the people away to follow themselves. And Jesus says all of them were thieves and robbers. Now, he's not talking about true shepherds like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and the prophets who spoke God's word. He's talking about people who had no care for the sheep, no regard for God's people. Jesus says they were nothing more than thieves 
and robbers. But now look at verse 9. Notice the promises Jesus makes. Verse 9, Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So let me point out these two promises. If you'll come to Christ, if you'll come to the door, here's what Christ promises you. The first promise, he promises his sheep protection. He says, if you go through the door, he will be saved. You'll have protection, safety, not only from the world, but also from the wrath of God. You will be protected. You will be saved. And what this is, if you're taking notes, this protection is solid safety. It is solid safety. The gate keeps out those who intend to harm the sheep. And Jesus promises to guard and protect his sheep from those who desire to hurt them. Jesus is saying, come through me and you'll find protection from the thieves and robbers. Enter the flock of Jesus and the religious leaders can no longer damage you. Jesus will guard you. And by the way, that warning still applies today, does it not? Are there not still thieves and robbers who are trying to hurt people in the church? You better believe it. There, I know a lot of people who don't go to church anymore because of a thief and a robber. Some, some leader in their church that was ungodly, who did something destructive in their life, and it burned them so bad, they don't ever want to step foot in a church again. Now, I'm not making an excuse for people. I think we have to still remember Jesus has never sinned against us. And yet, there are thieves and robbers still attempting to crawl over the fence and into the church with the goal of doing as much damage as possible. You can write down uh, Jude 3 and 4. Jude says, Beloved, though, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I find it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Listen to this verse. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. You hear that? Jude is warning the church of people who would creep in to destroy the flock. And so until Jesus returns, there will always be wolves that will walk along disguised as sheep. And their selfishness will ravage the flock. And so what's the application for you? The application is you need to be careful who you listen to and who you follow. Beware the preacher or teacher who tries to get you to follow himself instead of following Christ. The greatest danger to your spiritual health will most likely come from someone claiming to be a Christian. Someone who quotes a lot of Bible verses and distracts you from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's one reason why we need more godly pastors and shepherds, under shepherds, to protect from the wolves. That's how Jesus protects his sheep. He's not the only shepherd. He raises up other shepherds for his church. That's what the word pastor means. Did you know that? The word pastor comes from the word to shepherd, to be an overseer, to watch, to guard, to feed the flock. And so uh, you'll remember in the book of Acts chapter 20, Paul is leaving the church of Ephesus and he gives marching orders to the elders, the pastors. And one of the things he tells those pastors to do is to guard the flock from the wolves. Listen to this, Acts 20 verse 28. Paul said, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. And then he says, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert. We need to be alert. And that's why God so graciously gives 
the gift of pastors to the local church. Godly men who are able to, who understand doctrine, who are able to teach, who are able to protect from false teaching, who are able to lead the sheep to green pastures of solid theology and biblical doctrine so that the sheep may graze and not worry about the false teaching of wolves. And so I say that as a general call to this church, specifically to the men of our church. This is a call to any man who would aspire to that office of overseer. I don't need to be the only one in this church that God would raise up men who aspire to help shepherd the flock of God here at Riverview, to guard against false teachers, to teach the people the word of God, to lead them to the door. We need more pastors at Riverview, not less. And it's not just our church. We need more pastors at all churches. We need more and more godly men and women who know the Bible, who can teach and lead and protect. And so Jesus promises sheep, his sheep protection. There's one more promise he makes. He promises them plenty. Plenty. Jesus says in verse 9, If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, there's protection, and he will go in and out and find pasture. That's the plenty. So he's talked about solid safety, but what he's talking about here is soul satisfaction. He will satisfy you as his sheep. He'll give you everything you need to be satisfied in him. What good would it do to be protected from the dangers of the world if you're going to starve to death inside the flock? We need to remember that the Christian life is not simply being saved from something. We are saved to something. And as the door, Jesus promises that his sheep will have abundant life. If you look at verse 10, we'll we'll finish here today. In verse 10, Jesus says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Now you notice this this verse starts off with the thief again. This is probably one of the most misquoted verses in the Bible. Now you've heard this quoted before. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Who is that verse always applied to? The devil. But Jesus isn't talking about the devil in this verse. Who is the thief? Who is the robber? Do you remember? It's the Pharisee. It's the false shepherd. It's the leader of God's people that leads them away from the door. Now, is it wrong to say that the devil is a thief who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy? Is that wrong? No, it's not. In fact, Uh, I don't think it's wrong to even apply this verse to Satan secondarily because Jesus already told the Pharisees that they are of their father, the devil, and they are doing his desires. And so we can put that together and, and, and say that any attack of a wolf on God's sheep is of demonic influence. Satan is behind it, and yet Jesus is explicitly talking about false teachers Instead, Jesus says, I'm not like that thief. I came to give my people abundant life. This word abundant means to be super, super abundant. It means exceeding, surpassing what is normal and expected. It's like, it's like when you, this is a, this is a terrible example, and I, di- I didn't write this down before. This is where I get in trouble as a preacher as I start making up examples off the fly. I think it's like, there's like a thousand of these now I'm thinking of. It's like when you go to McDonald's and you order the fry and those fries are good and you order the medium, but they accidentally supersize it. That's abundant. That's like ex- surpassing what is normal and what is expected. It's like I asked for this thing, but I got even more than I wanted. And you probably got a better example than I do. That's what came to my brain. That may be where my brain is right now, thinking about French fries. It's this idea of overflowing, abundant to the point of overflowing. It's like God gives me more from himself than I would have ever found on my own. He, he, the Christian life is so much better than my life before Christ, I didn't even realize it. Before I was a Christian, I thought, this is what life is about. But then when I became a Christian, most of us probably thought, I didn't know it was this good. 
I mean, I know what he said. I know what was promised, but I didn't know it would be this good. And, and don't miss the fact, Jesus isn't just talking about life in heaven. He's not just talking about eternal life after death. He promises abundant life before death. Your Christian life is meant to abound and overflow with the joy of the Lord. You are, you are meant to be happy in God. We, we, are, we are to have abundant life. Now, let's be clear what that means in your notes. Abundant life does not mean that we will have more stuff. That is how that verse gets twisted. And any person who uses this verse to tell you abundant life means that God wants to give you a bigger house, a nicer car, a bigger boat, more money, a promotion at your job, and no more sickness is a false teacher. You see, false teachers don't lead you to the door. They try to go in another way. No, no, abundant life here means that we have peace and joy because we have God. You get God. You get him. We are not just protected from the destruction of sin. We are given the joy of walking with Jesus. Now that does not mean that we constantly frolic in the meadow where life is easy. Jesus does not promise you a trouble-free life. It will be difficult for you in this world because there are wolves. There are Thieves and robbers. There is a lion out there seeking whom he may devour. But here's what Jesus promises you. That no matter what happens in your life, no matter how bad it is, he promises us joy that is bigger and lasts longer than our troubles. Even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will not fear. Even when we feel like armies are encamped around us, Jesus will spread out a banquet table for us in the sight of our enemies. Christianity is not about obeying the rules. Christianity is about joy. Joy in God. And if your life is about anything other than Jesus Christ, I promise you that thing will steal your joy. It will rob you. Jesus did not call you out of the emptiness of sin to live in mediocrity. He called us to feast at his table, to rejoice in his presence. And so I would urge you to stop wandering away from the shepherd to seek out your own pasture and to find your own water. Because every time you do, you will find that the grass has withered and the water is bitter. The grass is not greener on the other side. It is green with Christ. And so come through the gate. Now, I'm going to give you a, a taste of a couple of weeks from now what we're going to get to. There's three things this text tells us. Jesus gathers his sheep. He guards his sheep. But this is ultimately leading to the fact that Jesus gives his life for the sheep as the shepherd. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. But I, wanna, I, wanna, I just want to make this connection today as we close the way you have abundant life is because Jesus Christ abandoned his life. The reason that you can have abundant life today and know the joy of the Lord is because Jesus Christ willingly gave up his life and laid it down as a good shepherd for his sheep. He gave his life on the cross. In our men's breakfast today, uh, Joshua Jones reminded us as men of how necessary it is to, to tell people of the gospel during this Christmas season. And I want to remind you of the gospel too. That God in his mercy did not leave you to your own fate, but he came and sent his son as a shepherd to lay down his life for his sheep and to gather them. And so I want to ask you this morning, maybe you've never become a Christian, but, but maybe you heard his voice today. Have you heard the Lord's voice calling you? And you say, well, what does that even sound like? It's, it's a call for you to repent and forsake your old life and to come to your shepherd and follow Jesus. And if you hear him now, while I'm, while I'm even speaking, Jesus Christ laid down his life, but he also had authority to take it up again. He was resurrected, and he commands anyone who would have eternal life to repent and believe in him. Turn from your sin 
and put your faith and trust in the good shepherd and follow him and you'll be saved and you will find good pasture. You can do that right where you sit today. Right where you sit, call upon the name of the Lord, repent of your sin and trust in Christ. And when this service is over, I will be available. I'd love to speak with you after our service to pray with you, answer questions, and to talk with you. But don't leave here today. If you hear the voice of the shepherd, don't leave today without following him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the the, the beautiful picture that Christ is our door. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way by which we have fellowship with you, Father. And the way we have fellowship with you is that The door is also the shepherd who laid his life down for the sheep. Oh God, during this Christmas season, may we not forget why Christ came into the world. He was born in Bethlehem to die, to die for sinners, to die for his sheep. And so Lord, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would call your own people by name today, that you would draw them out from the world and draw them by the power of your Holy Spirit to follow you. And Lord, uh, for us who are your sheep, I pray that we would experience the abundant, joyful, overflowing joy of the Lord that can only be found in knowing Jesus Christ. Help us to respond appropriately now as we sing with that type of joy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.